All right, everyone, here we are back on another episode of Stories from a Mountain Town. And we have our first guest with us today, my good buddy, Jeff Moberg. Say hi to everyone, Jeff. Hi, everybody. Just watched Penn State win, so I'm in good spirits. <laughs> yeah, we are, right? We are Penn State. Exactly. So before we get into anything, um, we wanted to kind of focus this podcast and a future episodes around a uh, signature whiskey or cocktail that the guests would want to bring. Uh, but today I brought some tin cup, some tin cup American whiskey for us today. So I'm going to pour that, a couple glasses of that. I got a buddy that started a whiskey distillery, so I could have brought his. Oh shit, yeah, you should have done that. It's back in Pennsylvania, so he's going to have to have to ship some out. Yeah. Didn't we try that one day? Yeah, it's good. Very good. Boardroom spirits. Yeah. All right. All right, cheers, man. Cheers. The football Saturdays. Football Saturdays. It's been snowing all day here in Jackson. We're here. We're actually in Jeff's apartment because we're watching the he had to have a he had to watch this important game for the Nittany Lions at his home at his own home field. He couldn't come to my apartment for it. I don't think people really understand the level of uh, <laughs> stress, dedication, preparation that it takes to watch a Penn State game, especially Penn State Michigan. So it was a big one. Yeah, definitely. So uh, so you went to Penn State. I went um, to Penn State. Yeah. That's why he's such a big fan. He's not just randomly a big fan, just for no reason. He went there. Um, what did you major in there? Uh, so I was a marketing major. Whoa! Um, yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, I didn't really, didn't really know what I wanted to do. All I knew, growing up, is that I wanted to go to Penn State. In fact, like God, I don't even know how old I was, but there were pictures like way back in the day. Of my bedroom, like when growing up, and I had Penn State wallpaper, Penn State pillows, Penn State bedspread, and then I had this letter on top of my bed from Joe Paterno that said it was addressed to me, and it said, Jeff, can't wait to see you on the field at Penn State. And it was, well, it, there was never another option. Like, I, my family went to Penn State. I think it's like, I don't know, like there's some areas of the country where you're just kind of born into to going to that school. Um, I don't think my parents never went to college, but I think they they always were big followers of, of you know, the Nittany Lions. And, um, you know, they really wanted me and my sister to both go there. And we ended up, yeah, both going there. But again, I don't think there was any really other option. In fact, I applied to one other school as a backup and I never got into, I didn't get into Penn State. I remember that day that I got, I got the letter in the mail. It was that like small little envelope and you know, all mm. my friends that got in, they probably, you know, a little bit smarter than me, did better on their SATs. And they were like, oh, I got my big packet. And then I was like, oh, big packet. Okay, look in the mail for the big packet. It's gotta be coming soon. And then I got this like little envelope and it, you know, you it was go, like, and you look at the end of the paragraph, you don't even need, to open, it, you don't even need to open it up, yeah. you know, you're just like, oh, geez, and they frame it up, you know, you're so smart, and you're great, but unfortunately, and then as soon as you read that, unfortunately word, you don't even read anything after that. Yeah. So, I was not accepting that they were not accepting of me going to Penn State. <laughs> So I wrote them a letter, and uh, I took pictures of my room and my uh, the letter on my wall from Joe Paterno. And I said to him, I'm like, look, you probably have a lot of people that applied to Penn State as backup options, and you're accepting them. And I'm like, take a chance on somebody that doesn't have a backup option and never really ever had a backup option and has always wanted to go to this school. It means more to me than it does to people that are literally just applying to colleges based on statistics. It's, it's, it's my blood. I, 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 I love it. I'm like, take a chance with me and see what happens. And then I got the big packet back in the mail. Probably, I don't know, it was a couple months later. Um, 
it was probably one of the best days of my life. Like that Whoa. one, I got rejected. And then two that I wrote them a letter and it actually did something like I did. I certainly didn't think I was going to get in. Um, I didn't really know what I was going to do. Cause again, I didn't apply to really any other schools, but it was, it was awesome. So that, yeah, that so is went, really cool. I went to Penn state on basically a, please accept me <laughs> kind of wish. I've never heard that story before. Yeah. I don't in think the, I ever told you. In, was, in to the listeners, he's, this is, Jeff is one of the guys I've been mentioning kind of in the intros and everything like that. Um, and this is not one of the stories I thought that he would be telling, <laughs> but this is amazing. Yeah. But, it, but that this is kind of shows through something that I've been noticing lately, just in life that, when you're when you authentically love something and and want it to happen for all the right reasons, I don't know if it's like people can recognize that really well, or you know maybe if you're into like karma or something like that, it works out. Um, where they thought... they authentically saw like you're into Penn State more than someone who's just like, oh yeah, Penn State has a decent program for what I want to go into, so I'll apply there too. Yeah. And that's really cool. I just think, like, in life, just don't make yourself a number. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, I don't blame them for not accepting me. I, I didn't have the numbers to get in. I kind of knew that going into it. Um, so I was, you know, hopeful that there would be a miracle where they somehow accepted me. But when I got that rejection letter, it wasn't anything that was surprising. Like, I was... Yeah. They, they weren't far off by any means. But, um, yeah, like... I just said, don't be a number. And anytime you can, you know, you can sell yourself where, you know, you might be looked at as a number for whether it's getting into college, whether it's a job interview, whether it's really whatever in life, like, I don't know, do something that stands out. And, um, you know, I, 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 if I never got in, if I never wrote that letter and I went to another school, yeah, I probably would have had a great time and forgot about going to Penn state, but like to me, like it was an opportunity. It was an opportunity to sell myself. And, um, I don't know, like, I don't take no very well for an answer. It's probably one of my flaws as well, but is that the Philly part of you? I think it is the Philly part of me. Like, I don't know. We're just Jeff, yeah. Jeff grew up, you'd call it a suburb of Philadelphia, right? Yeah. I was about, I was about 30 miles, um, North of Philadelphia. Yeah. What's it called? In, uh, the county, Bucks County, Pennsylvania is like very county. county oriented. Uh, nice. The town was Doylestown, Pennsylvania, which is, yeah. Doylestown Central, represent. Central Bucks County. Yep. Wow. So. That's awesome. So then after, <clears throat> after Penn State going to, um, what was like your, your first stop in your career path? Where did you go after, after you graduated from Penn State? Yeah, so, again, I didn't really know what I wanted to do, right? And all I knew is, like, I wanted to go to Penn State. And then I was, like, in college. Like, great, this is amazing. Obviously, Penn State's very good for its academics, but there's a lot of distractions, um, you know, and that, that, that might <laughs> Doesn't have... it... Sorry for cutting you off. Doesn't it, doesn't it end up in, like, the top five of party schools all the time? Yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, it's this town in the middle of Pennsylvania that literally there's there's not much around. Like whether you drive from Pittsburgh or you drive from from Philadelphia, you're kind of going through farmland up until you get to they call it Happy Valley, um, and then you just get to this town of amazingness. And it's you know I, I remember. When my, my parents dropped me off at college, you know, the parents like want to stick around. They want to take you out to dinner, make sure that you're set. And I don't even think I had like all the boxes were out of the car and I was kind of like, okay, all right, bye. Like you guys can go now. It's just one of those towns where you just feel like as soon as you get there, you're, you just want to kind of like when you go on vacation, if you go to like a resort, as soon as you step foot in that resort, you just almost feel like, okay, like, let's go to the bar, let's have fun, like, this is going to be great. Now, the tricky thing is, is, like, you can have a lot of fun, 
And I think that's probably why they let me in is I actually started. So freshman year, I started one semester late. So they, when, when they accepted me, they're like, okay, you can come, but you can't come until the second semester. So that's, I've never uh, heard that before. Yeah. Super weird. I don't think it's very common, but the advantage was, I think they wait for like those freshmen that, that come and then don't do well and oh, they yeah. leave, um, open up a few extra spots for people like me, but I was able to work and like make some money so I could pay for books or beer or whatever else you pay for in college. Um, so it was nice cause I kind of went into it, you know, with, with a little bit, a little bit of money under my belt where I could kind of get through. And I mean, of course, all that money ended up going to all my friends who didn't work, but, um, yeah. So anyway, back to marketing, didn't know what I wanted to do. Like knew I loved sports. That's kind of what led me to Penn state. I was a wrestler. Um, Pennsylvania is a very big wrestling state and, uh, actually at that time they weren't as good as they are now. They've been national champions for, God, I don't know how many years in a row, like eight or nine years in a row. Um, like Penn state. Yeah. Been national champs? Penn state wrestling. Well, wow. um, but I always wanted to play football. I played football since I was four and unfortunately I, I never really grew. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I'm, I'm fast, but I'm not. I'm not like the five foot seven guy that runs the, you know, four, one forty. I was like a little bit slower than that. So I kind of knew like in high school, okay, I'm going to have to figure it out academically. And I thought, all right, you know, I'll do business. I'll see, you know, see if it can kind of lead me in a direction. And, um, yeah, at that point, all I knew going into it was that I loved sports and that. Penn State has a really good business school, the Smeal College business. So I was like, okay, I'll just kind of go in. First two years are like, you know, they call it like the general classes where you figure out what you want to do. So I'm like, I'll go the business route. I didn't want to go to school for like 10 years, like doctors and lawyers. Um, <laughs> I had the same thought process. I was like, I don't have any desire to do any sort of grad school. Um, I barely had enough motivation to get through undergrad and just the reward system in school is much different than um, how I like to be rewarded, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I always thought, like, four years in college, I'm not going to lie to you, like, I thought it's like a, you know, it's a party scene. And why do I want to go to school for 10 years? Like, what happens when everybody leaves after four? And then what do you do then? Is it like you're the old guy partying? That's, like, weird. So I wanted to be done in four. I wanted to do it do it hard, do it right, do it fun. Um, but then also figure out a way to make some money, um, you know, after those four years. Cause like, I'm, again, it was like, you know, I, I, I went to school and I had to work through it. I had to have three jobs in college to be able to, you know, pay for rent and pay for books and all that. So it wasn't like I was, you know, had a, a position in, my dad's law firm after school was like, I had to figure something out to make money. And, um, so I knew it was like the four year plan. So I was just trying to figure out like, what's the best approach if I want to get out of here in four years. So, um, so yeah, so, so marketing was my major. And where did you, what, 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 uh, what was the first company you worked at after college? Okay. So Penn state does a really good job of re like on campus recruiting. So your senior year, they bring in a lot of companies to the basketball arena. And the rule is like, I think if you're a senior, you can go to it as long as you don't miss any sort of interview, which might sound easy, but it's not because the interviews are based on when the company can interview you. And sometimes they're at like eight in the morning. And I mean, if it's a, a fun band playing at the bar and, um, you know, you have to, you know, you have to use some judgment. And after three years at Penn State, it's very hard to understand what priorities are. So actually, funny story. So the first interview I had, of course, was at 8 a.m. It was with Gallo Wines. I had no idea what Gallo Wines were, but I heard 
wine in the name. And I'm like, okay, I think I could do this. I've been studying alcohol for the last three years. And, uh, you know, I could probably come in and hit the ground running with, with Gallo wines. <laughs> so I had this interview and they, of course they picked 8 a.m. And the date of the interview is November 1st, right after Halloween. Oh and my God. Halloween is not only obviously a big, a big holiday, especially when you're in college, but it was, it was the bar that I used to always go to was having a huge Halloween party and it was like 10 cent drinks. So the right course of action would have been, you know, to not go to the Halloween party, but obviously I didn't, didn't do that. Um, so I somehow wake up. I think it was actually my roommate, Anthony, that like shook me. And he's like, dude, you have your interview. You have to go to this interview or else you're out of the whole recruiting thing. So I wake up still completely, probably drunk. Um, you were just sampling their products is all you had to say, really. Well, yeah, I had no idea, no idea what, the, what this interview was about. I had zero opportunity to research a company. Um, I just knew I had to get there because if you go, then you're good. So I'm walk, I put on my suit, I walk up to the Bryce Jordan Center, and one of my buddies who was actually at the party, the Halloween party the night before, had like an interview even earlier, which I didn't even know existed. <laughs> so he's passing me as I'm walking into the Bryce Jordan Center as he's leaving, and he's like, oh my God, dude, I hope you're doing better than me. And I'm like, not much, man. Like this is going to be really interesting. And I'm like, who did you interview with? And he's like a company called Siemens. And back at Penn state, there was this local furniture company called Siemens. And they always had this commercial on during football games. And it would be like this. I remember it was like this catchy slogan, like during the commercial, see Siemens best. And like, it was his furniture company. So he's going into this interview thinking he's interviewing with this furniture company that's local. Turns out it's like a pharmaceutical company that's national, if not global. I don't even know. So he goes into the interview thinking he's interviewing with a local furniture company. Obviously, that didn't go very well. So I walk past him and he's like, Jeff, I have to tell you something. And I'm like, what? And he's like, you have a huge penis in Sharpie on the back of your neck. Oh, no. So my roommate, Tim Schultz, used to love to Sharpie you in penis. And you could always tell it was Tim because he had a very odd penis drawing on your neck. Like, it was it was a signature Tim Schultz penis where somehow it was longer or wider than it was long. <laughs> so I was like, is it a wide penis, Fred? And he's like, it's a wide penis, Schultz. And I'm like, God damn, Schultz. So I go into this interview... I run in, or before I went into the interview, I run in the bathroom, but obviously, like, you know, I was basically racing to get there by 8 o'clock. So I'm, like, scrubbing the back of my neck. I have no idea what it looks like. I'm really, I kind of prop the collar of my suit up to hope that nobody sees it. It was just, like, it was the worst, probably one of the worst experiences. Um, fortunately, it was with Gallo Wines, who I thought would be laid back. Um, I didn't get that job. I did not get that job. <laughs> it's weird. But you showed up to the interview so professionally. Yeah. Um, but then after the interview, I remember you could walk around and hand out your resume to some other companies. And Under Armour was there. And they were, um, I mean, this. I graduated college in 2006. Under Armour started in 1995 was like Kevin Plank's first t-shirt. But they really didn't take off until, you know, early 2000s. So they were super small. Um, you know, trying to build the company out of Baltimore. And so I walked up, gave him a resume. And I think what stood out is like, I was a sports guy, um, you know, in the interview with them, I just said, look, I came to Penn state because I'm a sports guy. I didn't know what I wanted to do. All I knew is that I wanted to do something in sports because that's my passion. Um, that's what led me to coming to Penn state. And I'm a business guy. If I can somehow combine business and sports together, I think it would be the best of both worlds. And then, yeah, I got the call from them and um, they offered me a position down in Baltimore, which was perfect because it's um, it was about two and a half hours away from my 
hometown so I could still go back when I wanted to because I had season tickets to the Eagles games. So I would do that drive every every Sunday up 95 to go to the games on Sunday. But it was far enough where my parents weren't going to come down just to check in on me. So, um, so I thought Baltimore at that time was like the perfect choice. That's a sweet spot where they, they're not going to just pop in, but when you need help or money or something, you can always go back. Or... Yeah, if I wanted to have them down for a weekend, like, hey, yeah. like, I miss you guys secretly, like, hey, like, let's go to Costco. Yes. Um, yeah, I've done know, they that, would, they would come down. times. But, um, so yeah, so I worked at, I got a job at Under Armour. It was like a very basic, like, entry-level data entry job, nothing related to marketing. But I thought it was a cool company. Um, so I was actually, to backtrack, I was on a high school football team that we were three-time state champions. And at one point, we were number three in the country. So we were kind of a big a big deal. We were getting a lot of national press. Um, we had ESPN do a documentary on us. And Under Armour actually came in to our high school with their catalog, which was, I think, like literally four styles at that time. This was back in... I guess it was, you know, 2000, 99 to, to 2002 is out when I was in high school. So they came in, they outfitted our team. Um, and so when they, when they just had like, just like the cold gear stuff? Yeah, they had heat gear and cold gear in, in black and white. And that was it. I always, I never could figure out, <laughs> without having to read the descriptions, which one you wanted based on just... Uh, cold gear or heat gear because it was like cold gear was for the cold yeah heat gear was for the warm and yeah. not like the other way around where it's like heat gear to keep you hot yeah we had actually I yeah, always got confused with that there were a lot of meetings days. that went on about that so heat gear is when it's hot when it's hot yeah it keeps you cool cold gear is when it's cold but I'm sure there was god knows how many hours it went into figuring out if it should be the opposite but um yeah and I never really wore their heat gear. I just always wore their cold gear. But anyway, I used that. Obviously, I dropped that line in my interview with Under Armour and said, hey, I played for CB West. And um, you guys actually came in and outfitted our team. And uh, I'm familiar with your product. And I mean, it was a game changer because at that time, everybody was wearing like long sleeve cotton baggy shirts under their uniform when it was cold. And just to think like, I mean, I guess it was a while ago, but it doesn't seem like it was that long ago. Is it, and isn't that how um, Under Armour got started? Who was yeah. the, the founder? So Kevin Plank. Yeah, didn't he? He like played in college <clears throat> and was sick of just wearing cotton t-shirts under his pads. Yeah, he played in Maryland. Um, yeah, and then and he just was like, we needed like a came up with a synthetic idea for just an under to wearing it under your pads, right? Yeah, he was literally like sewing the the product in his mom's basement. Um, yeah. yeah, it was just it was. I think he was good, but I think he was kind of like that medium caliber. Knew he wasn't going to make it to the next level, and um, I think he's just a business guy. Like he was just thinking about a way to improve the experience. Like if you ever meet Kevin Plank, um, it's all he ever thinks about is like a way to improve process and. I mean, God, every meeting that you're in with him was like how you could build the next great product. I remember he always said, like, Under Armour still has not defined who they are yet. We still haven't built a product that's going to define the brand. And um, I think wow. he's just super a go-getter on, on figuring out better ways of doing something. So Shout out Kevin Plank. If you want, ever want to be on the podcast, Jeff and I would love to host you out here in Jackson, Wyoming. Um, he I'll actually, be- yeah, he owns a... He, Owns a whiskey distillery too. Um, wow, which has done really well. Yeah, Kevin Plank's got it. He's got it going for him. So, yeah, that's awesome. So, so you yeah. work. You you get in as a, kind of just a would you say a data input kind of job, and then um, yeah. So at that time, it was um, again, it was not super young. Like when I got there, there were you know. A number of people that were there. I think I was actually like number two hundred out of um, when I left. When I ended up leaving, I think they had like two thousand. So I was early 
in the sense of like how big they became, but a company of 200 is still, you know, it's still seen as a pretty big company. I think they were like doing about $300 million a year. When I got there, when I left, they had just hit a billion. So, um, so we grew a lot, um, but I had already come into a pretty established company. So at what point did you flip? Um, so now for the listeners, Jeff, Jeff does like product design for a company here in steel. Um, at what point did you flip from thinking you wanted to go marketing or business or whatever job you had at the time to, um, going to like the product design side of the company? Yeah. So, so again, Under Armour hired me, I was doing a job that was data entry wasn't glamorous by any means but they did a really good job of like once you're in they promote from within um and i think it was like after a year you you could leave that department it was like kind of known where like after a year your manager would either have to sell you on staying or you could explore other departments especially for like people that are just entering right because they all kind of enter in these basic roles Mm -hmm. Um, so I lucked out. It was literally like right around a year after I had started, I guess, August of 2006. And then, um, yeah, around like August of 2007, they were talking about starting footwear and, you know, I was kind of big into sports, as I mentioned before, and I felt like I was at a sports company, but I wasn't really doing anything related to like sports. It was mainly just like numbers. I wasn't seeing product. I wasn't like really involved in anything that was sports other than the fact that I had an Under Armour logo on my business card. So they were starting footwear and they were looking for people. And I walked upstairs and I I met with, um, I remember I just walked into the, chief merchandiser's office. His name was Rafel Peck. Um, and I said, Hey, look, I work downstairs in sales operations. Um, gave him a little bit of my background. I played football. I was a wrestler. I went to Penn state. Like why I kind of took the job at Under Armour. And, um, I'm like, look, I'll do anything if it allows me to be involved in what you guys are building. And, we just kind of hit it off and he, he gave me an opportunity to move up to the footwear team as they were just launching. And my role was, they used to like a lot of um, analogies with like football, right? So I was the safety because it's like the last line of defense, right? So you kind of do, to be honest, it was a not a glamorous role. You're doing, you're basically doing anything that anybody needs to meet their deadline if they realize that their deadlines approaching and they're, they're not going to get it done. So, um, it wasn't much of a better job, but it was on a team that's in product development and I just worked hard and I had a really good manager and uh, a guy named David Stakel and he let me kind of explore like all the departments. Like I would go into design and see what they're doing. They had a 3d printer where they were printing the outsoles and on shoes. And I just thought it was so freaking cool to be involved now in a part of the company where you're actually building the products that that people are wearing um so yeah it was just kind of like a sponge on the wall um i mean again it was i wasn't i was young so i wasn't like oh i need to be at this level i was just like super happy with where i was at baltimore is really cheap to live in i was making enough money to be able to you know, pay my rent, go out on the weekends. And I worked for this company where it was like all young, fun, cool, like ex athletes that had been brought in. It was just like, it was super cool. That was really, that's really bold of you to just like go up to that manager guy and say, Hey, I want to do something more and something better. And uh, there's a lot of people that wouldn't have done it that way. 